Hi, I'm Tracy Jeffrey. On behalf of the congenital feature editors of seminars in thoracic and cardiovascular surgery, I'd like to welcome everyone to a roundtable discussion on the organization of centers performing congenital heart surgery. Today, we have a group representing a variety of different size surgical programs and experiences, and I'll have each of them briefly introduce themselves before we get started. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Dr. David Overman. I'm Chief of Cardiovascular Surgery at Children's Minnesota uh, in Minneapolis. That's a freestanding uh, community-based children's hospital. I've been there my whole career, and I am currently the president of the Congenital Heart Surgeon Society. Hello, uh, my name is Carl Backer, um, and I work at the Joint Heart Program uh, between Kentucky Children's Hospital and Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Um, uh, one is a smaller kind of essential program and obviously Cincinnati Children's is a comprehensive program. Uh, I previously spent uh, 25 years in Chicago at a major uh, medical center there, uh, Lurie Children's Hospital. Hi, uh, Chris Calderon here. Uh, I've worked in small volume programs and large volume programs, Iowa, Toronto Sick Kids and Texas Children's Hospital and for the last year or so I've been dedicating myself to helping individuals and uh, programs uh, do better in terms of caring for patients with congenital heart disease largely through team optimization. Thank you all for being here. It's well appreciated that delivery of care for patients with congenital heart disease is variable across programs, and various analyses of the data over the years have shown an association between higher institutional congenital heart surgery surgical case volumes and better patient outcomes. This has prompted increasing discussion about whether reorganization of the centers that perform congenital heart surgery could provide better patient care delivery. Specifically, this concept of regionalization as has been performed in the Canadian and European healthcare systems has been discussed. This refers to reducing the number of pediatric cardiac centers, which would allow a higher volume of cases to be performed at the remaining centers. If the aforementioned association between volume and outcomes holds, that would theoretically improve the quality of care delivered overall across the country. So this has prompted a recent document on the programmatic organization that was led by the CHSS and endorsed by the AATS. So I'm gonna ask some directed questions of our panelists, um, but I hope that that's gonna prompt some responses from other panelists and that this can be an ongoing discussion. Dr. Overman, is the number of centers performing congenital heart surgery the problem in and of itself, or is it only problematic in the context of outcomes? Well, I, I think this, uh, your characterization of where this idea came from and where the regionalization um, <clears throat> um, initiatives uh, sprung from was a, a series of studies uh, that were theoretical models for regionalization in the United States. And indeed, uh, those from those studies we know that two-thirds of the programs in the United States are located within 25 miles of one another and about three quarters of small volume programs are within the same distance of a large volume program. So um, there is seemingly by that description an excess of centers, but um, I, I want to be very clear on the f intent of the regionalization initiatives and discussion is not to close centers. Uh, and nor is it to reduce access. In fact, we've been tried to be very careful about reduction of access. I think you're going to ask a little bit more about that later. Um, but th the fact that you have, say, many uh, smaller volume programs in close proximity, even just sheer intuition would tell you, well, perhaps if though we found a way for those centers to collaborate or uh, combine, uh, then you have broader experience, higher volumes, which, as we know, uh, it's not the sole determinant of quality of care, but there is certainly a statistical association of volume and outcome. So I think, you know, to answer your question, it's a little bit of both. There's probably more centers than we need, which cost us in aggregate, cost us a lot of money, uh, resource-wise, and the, the present arrangement and structure doesn't, isn't, you know, designed to optimize outcomes. Dr. Backer, what are your thoughts on the, you've written a lot about and talked a lot about the um, volume 
and uh, outcomes relationship, and particularly in the context of programs that are close together, where you have a large volume center and another small volume center 20 miles down the road, what is, what, how do we navigate that, what, those waters? That is a little bit challenging. Well, I think uh, a lot of that is actually already happening. So just to give you an example, when I started in Chicago 30 years ago, there were seven programs doing congenital heart surgery in the metropolitan area of Chicago, which uh, really didn't make much sense, uh, as we know now. And now, one by one, those pro the, some of the smaller programs, for various reasons, um, they can't find a surgeon, they have uh, issues with their ICU, they, whatever, they've closed down. So now there's really only three programs in the city of Chicago that do congenital heart surgery, and two of them uh, are kind of a joint program. So I think that uh, some of this is, has already happened. And I think it's actually a good thing um, because when we, I would look back on my experience when I was in Chicago, we would, as one of the major centers, we would get sent some of the patients who'd had complications at some of the smaller centers that sometimes were doing operations that they probably shouldn't have been taking on, challenging cases. And how do we, how do we identify what those cases are within any given center on an individual level? Well, I think the stat category is very helpful for that. Um, and I think it's also some of it is common sense. I mean, I think, you know, when you have a, a truncus with an interrupted aortic arch and you're doing, you know, one truncal repair every two or three years, that probably is not a case a small center should take on. It's a great question, though, because, you know, uh, and, and Chris is sort of leading the effort, uh, but we know that there are small volume programs that do excellent work. So it it, it isn't simply small equals bad and large equal good, but it's there are components uh, within smaller volume programs that produce excellent outcomes. So the CHSS currently is endeavoring to figure out, well, what are the attributes of smaller volume programs that, that do that? I don't know, Chris, you want to talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, we need to un understand this better, which is why we've kind of launched this study. Um, Basically, to describe it, there, we're defining small volume programs as in the 75 to 200 annual index cases per year range. Um, within that range, there are some programs that have consistently performed extremely well. Um, and what we need to know is what are the attributes of those small volume programs associated with superior performance? Yes, we'll get the kind of quantitative data we usually acquire, which is uh, will be achieved through a survey, but we also want to do directed qualitative interviews with the chiefs of these programs to look at some of the softer things that may have a very important influence on how a small volume program can perform exceptionally well. Uh, for example, the relationship with the administrative structure. Um, their uh, ability to deploy uh, funds and resources uh, within their organization, trust, shared consciousness, empowered execution, common purpose. These types of things may actually be very important. I've spent a lot of time in the last year in small volume programs and very, very big programs. And one thing that small volume programs can achieve is this sense of oneness. Uh, where the entire team is just super focused on every individual patient, and that it may be one of the key criteria. The other thing that I've noticed is they can provide a patient experience that's very, very personal. Uh, in, a, in a very large volume programs, I often find families just having a lot of trouble figuring out who their doctor is. Uh, in the small volume programs, they're all there all the time. So there are ways to achieve excellence in small volume programs that may be very different than how large volume programs do it. But what we need to do is create a roadmap for small volume programs to reach higher levels of excellence, to decrease variability, um, because that is ultimately what we want, is as good a care as possible close to home. And I think, you know, the regionalization idea is really about organically um, derived relationships that now if I'm in a smaller place I have a planful relationship with a larger center where we work out together what's appropriate 
in Lexington, what's appropriate in Cincinnati. Um, and then the patients can learn that ahead of time. That happens not because, oh, a case went bad, we need to transfer you to blah, blah, blah. But instead, we do all of our stat fives, you know, here. Mm -hmm. And and it, it ends up being a much better arrangement for both institutions, mm -hmm. but most importantly for, for the patient and the family. Mm -hmm. Dave, can I add something to that? Oh, sorry, Carl, did you? Well, I was just gonna add that, I mean, that's the, the model that I've been working in the last four years. Um, Kentucky Children's is a smaller hospital with 200 beds. Uh, Cincinnati Children's has 750 beds. We have two surgeons, 10 cardiologists. They have 60 cardiologists and four surgeons, um, and they are a full service bank. And we, so we end up transferring about one patient a month from Kentucky Children's up to Cincinnati Children's, but they're receiving care at Cincinnati Children's that they could never get at our hospital. I mean, I remember a recent case where the patient needed a total artificial heart. That was the only thing. We don't do that. Cincinnati does it. And then they did the transplant. I mean, um, and I think that the patients get the best possible care with that relationship. Um, and uh, it really works very well. So what I was going to say is uh, this this term regionalization I think is a bit of a problem too because it, it sounds like a verb, like you're going to regionalize someone, mm -hmm. like it's yeah. going to happen at them. Uh, what we're really talking about is mutually aligned collaboration where mm -hmm. we you know, kind of uh, um, huddle around the common mission, which is to provide as best care as we can, uh, as close to home as possible, as much as possible. but ultimately the best care yeah, we can. Yeah, something like regional collaborative networks or some, exactly. some such idea like that. Because I, I think this, this specter of being gobbled up by a big program is not, play, is not helping us to uh, drive this initiative, but mm. this, the, the uh, beautiful image of you know, shared mission and collaboration actually may help us move the needle quite a bit. Well, I, I think that that's an interesting though segue into the next question that I have, which is what the barriers actually are to doing this, which the biggest thing that I see is actually that even though the mission is driven by providers um, at the surgeon level, who's actually responsible for enforcing it? Because the payment structure ultimately does limit our ability to do some of these things and the fact that we aren't the administrators in these hospitals. Yeah. Um, so how do we, Dr. Overman, how do we, who do we let start these discussions and how do we navigate the hospital-based and system-based relationships that are going to be required to do this successfully? Yeah, no, that that's exactly right. Um, there are significant interstate barriers in particular um, you know the uh, in most uh, <clears throat> institutions the Medicaid population at children's hospitals is anywhere from 40 to even 60 percent of the the patients so that uh, that's that can be a problem however just as as uh, Carl was talking about I mean that's an interstate relationship Kentucky to Ohio and uh, I know that uh, I know that University of Michigan has the same arrangement with South Dakota, for instance. So I think you can, you know, it's not a you can overcome this. It is a, there is a certain energy of activation. Most pr commercial payers, it's not a thing. Like they'll, you know, if you're out of network or whatever. But you do need the administra administrators of either your heart center or the hospital in general to to carry that water. Obviously, we're not going to be doing it as clinical surgeons. Mm -hmm. But I think who's so operationally responsible, that would be, you know, administrators uh, probably. But we really have to lead the church. I mean, it's got to come from us, the inspiration, the, the why. Um, we need to articulate because naturally, if you're a hospital administrator, you're going to go, well, why are we doing that? Like, and and so we have to, you know, make very clear why it is why it is necessary. And 
in at least in my personal experience, and we have a formal collaborative with Mayo Clinic, so they're 115 miles south, totally different practice than ours in an urban setting. We're neonatal infant heavy. They're obviously world famous for their adult congenital care and whatnot. Uh, so that's a very complementary clinical picture. It isn't always going to be that way in every location, but um, um, the, the point is that when we come, say a family's uh, going to be uh, born in, or they have an older child who we already operated on who has a problem that Dr. Duraney is an expert in. And if we go to that family and go, you know, you really ought to be operated in Rochester. And I, you know, I can come down, we'll do the case together. And uniformly, families are incredibly appreciative of that, that two institutions are coming together to provide in their, what in their professional judgment is the best possible care that, for that patient and vice versa. Well, and I think that that um, begs the question of is the Dr. Backer, I think you can answer this too, is is location then important? The location of these centers and the proximity to each other, the proximity to the patients that they're serving, how important is that? And is there a role for further distance relationships to be established as well? Well, I think, uh, you know, location is part of how, you know, these collaborative practices are going to come together. Um, and I think, uh, again, Cincinnati Children's uh, collaborates with some other institutions, not just in cardiac surgery, but in other, you know, sub sub specialty fields in the, you know, in that Midwest region, and uh, I think that's a very Im important way to to have this happen. Um, we don't want to close any centers per se, but we would like them to stratify the way they take care of their patients so that they get to the appropriate location. But um, as you know, as David mentioned, you know, two thirds of centers are within 25 miles of each other. I mean, it's amazing. And uh, the other thing I will say when we did that study was we were shocked at how, how much travel there was, you know, people from California were going to Boston, people from, you know, the East Coast were going to Texas, people were going to, you know, I mean, all, all kinds of travel. And I think that um, some of these uh, areas that have too many, you know, three centers in a medium-sized city, if they had one center that was, you know, well-developed, uh, people wouldn't feel like they needed to go somewhere else so you know and and that study did demonstrate that you could do that and it didn't affect patient travel distance at all in fact it, the travel distance reduced a little bit mm. so the the at the access to care thing which is something we we're very careful about like in say Chris Masio presented stuff this morning he's the only center in West Virginia, right? Mm -hmm. So he maybe doesn't make the volume criteria of a comprehensive center, but there would be in states that only have one place, you know, exceptions to the rule or whatever, the volume metric rule. Yeah, and that, for location, that was one of our major goals, to try to have every state, because most of it is Medicaid from the mm -hmm. state money. Every state should have a program. And I think that, you know, there's about seven states that wouldn't fall into that category, but five of them have so such a low population that they just would, could never have a congenital heart. You have to have a certain population to generate congenital heart patients. Mm -hmm. And so what about these areas? So where you do have a program, it maybe isn't a comprehensive program, then patients do need to be sent out. Like, are there any ethical ethical considerations to think about in terms of who is the most disadvantaged by this prospect, by the need to travel or the almost sort of requirement to travel. Dr. Calderon, do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, and uh, I want to come back to the long distance referrals too, because we should talk about that. I think that this, uh, I think even 25 or 40 miles is a big deal for some families. Uh, and 25 miles in Manhattan is two hours. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's a, it can be a very meaningful distance and it can put families at a huge financial disadvantage. Um, by way of anecdote, uh, when I started out in Iowa, we had a good team. This, it was a lot harder to get Norwoods to survive back then and we actually had some pretty good outcomes. I mean, we were about 80% survival, which back then was pretty good. 
but there was no family that we took care of that I didn't say, you know, Ed Bove at the time was the guy who could get Norwitz to survive. You should go to Ann Arbor. And they just wouldn't go. They didn't want to go. But they didn't want to go because, one, there was a huge financial burden, and many of the families in Iowa couldn't manage that. But two, the specter of being in a foreign area with doctors they're not familiar with, the unfamiliarity, uh, that's intimidating. Yep. And there's, there's real value in being cared for in your community that you've been cared for, sure. for in the past. Yeah, uh that has some value that, yes, a percentage point increased survival has to be balanced against these other issues that are very real. And yes, of course, we want the highest survival possible, but these other things are important too. And they often get cast aside in these discussions. Well, I'll push back just a little bit on that though, Chris. Um, I mean, because uh, in my experience reviewing programs, it's very disheartening to go a program that did six Norwoods and five died. So if you're in Iowa and you can do 80%, I mean, whether you're 80% survival or 90% with Ed Beauvais, that's pretty close margin. But you shouldn't, some centers shouldn't be doing, you know, complex lesions when the outcomes are really not good. I mean, that's well, a problem. I, yeah. And we don't, we can't forget that where this whole regionalization thing started with Bristol Infirmary, you know, with you know, huge number of uh, mortalities and, and many locations right. in the United States, United States where the same thing has happened. And that's what we that's what we're trying to get away from. So we're, it's very easy to take the extreme I took, which is where there wasn't that much difference. Yeah. The extreme you took where there is an enormous difference. Yeah. But there's a big middle ground in there where these the ramifications of any imposed regionalization yeah. scheme is going to have some very real consequences that aren't necessarily included in the statistics. Another important statistic or, or consideration is outside of the congenital world, if a program closes and it happens to be a significant financial generator for that institution, well, the downstream repercussions may be they lose their dialysis program or they lose their mm -hmm. allergy clinic or, you know, I mean, these other, this is a zero-sum game. So it gets back to the idea that the best thing we can do is decrease variability, improve okay. performance in these programs, and get a clearer line in what they can manage and what they should not manage yeah. and use that and it may differ from institution to yeah, institution. A couple, couple points of clarification. Number one, the, there is this, uh, you know, limitation of access narrative about, but, but again, I'll stress the, the modeling, even if you do close places, which we're not wanting to do, but even if you did, the travel distance doesn't change. And so uh, it's a little bit of a straw uh, dog to, to say, oh, you know, you're, you're, you're go we're going to, or, or to posit that there's some sort of uh, ethical problem with that. In fact, I think it's the opposite, that you, you can have your cake and eat it too, believe it or not. Like if you were to, you know, form these collaborative networks organically and locally, now p patients can stay. They don't need to go to Ann Arbor because now they have a higher quality uh, center yes. in their own locality. Mm. So that's the objective. And that's it's not, victory. It's not yeah. to close centers, it's to <clears throat> create networks wherein the most complicated patients don't have to go to Stanford or Mm. you know, Boston or Houston or wherever, because now the care locally is that much better. So to me, it's rather than it being an ethical problem, it's an ethical imperative to do it. That's that's how I feel about mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, we, we talked a lot about sort of the patients and their access to care. Dr. Calderon, how might surgeons be affected by this type of change? Well, uh, just doing the math, 
if if the, the specter of regionalization and closings and everything else was played out in its most terrible form, there would be fewer <laughs> surgeons in the country doing the same number of cases. And if that was the case, it would be harder for new graduates to find jobs. There would be less availability. I don't think that would ever happen, but if you did the math, it, that would be an inevitable. I think actually what's more likely to happen through creation of more and more of these kind of mutually aligned collaborations or regional collaboratives or whatever we want to call them, I think the surgeon in the future is going to be much more likely to be traveling to uh, one, the surgeon from one center going with their patient to the other center to participate in their care, which is a very, very uh, well received by the family. Uh, another is the surgeons from one center going to perhaps the smaller center to assist in cases or help with, uh, you know, conferences and that sort of thing, video conferencing back and forth. I just think uh, the surgeon may find, uh, have a pair of loops in multiple institutions. Well, the other thing is that, um, you know, you've got a certain number of cases and a certain number of surgeons, and if more of the cases are done at larger centers, they're going to have to hire some of those surgeons. So mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I don't think, I don't look upon this as a problem for, you know, surgeon employment. Mm -hmm. Well, in terms of the raw numbers, it's not right. necessarily I mean, a problem. Uh, uh, yeah, it may be a little bit of rose-colored glasses. I mean, I, I think but we other probably thing, well, do yeah. have more surgeons than we need, uh, you know, truth be told. Um, but um, this isn't like, I, I don't, I mean, most of uh, the, the 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 reflex to be worried about what what am I going to do with my life is is I think that's grossly uh, exaggerated, you know, in in mm. the minds of people in this conversation. Well, what do you think about the traveling thing? Well, I, well, I just want to say, um, you know, the recommendations paper. We every program should have at least two centers, mm -hmm. two two surgeons. Mm -hmm. So there are. There are a number of centers in the United States now that have one surgeon, and I think that that's... Um, yeah, that's a good point. That they should have two surgeons. We've also talked about the number of surgeons that even comprehensive centers should have, at least three. So, you know, yeah. there are some comprehensive centers I know of now that only have two surgeons, and they probably should have more. So uh, part of the issue, I think, is that the old days of uh, a congenital heart surgeon thinking he had to do two to 300 cases a year to be a good surgeon is probably... You know, that led to surgeon burnout, it led to other issues. Uh, I mean, things happen with people's families, uh, and I think that that paradigm, that m mindset needs to change a yeah. little bit. Yeah. And you can have, you know, surgeons uh, doing fewer cases but still being very productive and getting enough, you know, quote unquote, reps to do the operations. Well, so, that was actually going to be my next question is so, as opposed to this sort of what I would consider to be an older model where everybody can do everything and does everything, does this also leave a space for people to be very good at a certain operation okay. or a couple of operations and then for other people to be very good at another set of operations? Uh, yeah, I think that that makes a lot of sense. I think that co-scrubbing cases will be uh, more and more an expectation on the part of centers like this. Uh, but for sure, the idea that, you know, a, a program is functional until one human leaves town or takes vacation or gets run over by a bus or whatever. I mean, you, you can't be one person deep. Yeah. That's not, uh, that's not, not allowable. sustainable. Yeah. Right. It's definitely a big threat in small volume programs, single points of failure. Yes. They, they often have multiple single points of failure, yeah. whereas the very large programs, any one individual can have any issue happen, but the program keeps running. Yeah. Yeah. It's the middle-sized programs where they, I think they very well may have the sweet spot where you have enough redundancy in the program so there's no single points of failure, but you're still small enough that you can have that sense of oneness and uh, situational awareness widely distributed throughout the program um, and you know it would be interesting but that may be the sweet spot mm -hmm. and that's like about 200 to 400. 
As someone who recently graduated from training within the last few years, and there have been lots of discussion about how we change the training paradigm for congenital heart surgeons, for better, for worse, more programs, less programs, how does this, does this strategy really potentially play into that? Dr. Backer? Well, uh, yeah, the American Board of Thor Thoracic Surgery has looked into this uh, uh, a lot, and we recently changed the training paradigm from a one-year uh, fellowship to a two-year fellowship. And the reason for that was that the when you looked at the uh, residents who were finishing their congenital heart surgery training, most of them were barely making a minimum number of cases, uh, which was 75 cases. Uh, and in particular, they weren't uh, doing very many of the high complexity cases. Um, now, I will say that's an improvement from when we didn't have a ACGME fellowship, where many of the uh, you know people that did a cardiac congenital cardiac surgery fellowship might never do a complex case or basically first assisted and watched the whole time. So, but we felt that. Um, it's important that these uh, residents, when they finish their training, that they uh, actually uh, feel pretty good about doing some of these, you know, higher complexity cases. Uh, so now the it's a two-year training paradigm. They have to do 150 cases, uh, of which uh, a higher number, I think it's eight or nine, have to be complex cardi congenital cardiac cases. So I think that the the whole idea that um, you know when we talk about uh, uh, some of the uh, regionalization or collaborative practices where there's you know more uh, cases at some of the larger centers uh, those are going to be the centers training our, our congenital cardiac surgery residents right now we have 17 programs that do that are ACGMB approved to do uh, congenital cardiac surgery training and we only really need six to eight residents to finish per year for the uh, the multiple manpower studies over the last 20 years uh, so I think what we're going to see, uh, what I would like to see, is um, uh, fewer training programs with a higher quality product based on more cases while they're residents. Yeah, that's it. I mean, I, <clears throat> as I said before, I think there is an oversupply of, um, you know, kind of undertrained surgeons, and uh, I, I do that. Uh, they're they're sort of separate problems uh, in my mind, but um, <clears throat> I think the impact of this trend on education will be actually positive, not negative, because there will be fewer of these opportunities for people to be in environments where they really can't learn the trade, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden they have this imprimatur, and now they're, you know, out there, uh, and um, I've you know, I've bent Carl's uh, ear about this, and 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 Doctor Dave was my Rainey's. resident, so he, yeah, he's come a long way. <laughs> yeah, he's come. A long way. <laughs> and so now he's the president. The the I think the ABTS needs to, you know, uh, take a hard look at how we're doing this training, and are we actually producing a product that is, you know up to snuff, and I, I, I have my doubts about that. Well the, well, the other thing about the training, though, is that, I mean, there are so many more operations that we do now, and there's so many more nuances, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, hybrids, flow restrictors, complex neonatal, I mean, compared to what it was 20 years ago, so there's a lot more for the residents to learn, and I think that, again, that's a two-year training program. You just finished your training. I mean, did you... You did probably 18 months. I actually did uh, two years. Two I years. Did two years at two years at CHOP. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. But not necessarily because I had to. So I did. I did. Ended up doing three years. But um, but but I think that I agree. There are there are limitations to that. And what I also see though in this, which is a really important thing, is the potential, at least based on the conversations that we've just had, for the early career period for those graduates to this be very correct. productive. This correct. Is particularly in a situation where you're saying surgeons may travel, meaning that a junior That's surgeon correct. might be able to be mentored in a location by a senior surgeon who's come from somewhere else who is potentially an expert at a specific operation that otherwise that junior surgeon would not get that well, exposure to. I mean, I can to. give you personal, like uh, Elizabeth Stevens, junior uh, partner of Dr. Draney at Mayo, trained with Dr. Becker at Lurie uh, as a fellow, 
in her first job out and we have a very I drive down there and and first assist her on mm -hmm. cases and this is exactly whereas I don't know that Joe would necessarily have the bandwidth to be doing that uh, and as you know uh, Epstein and Hokum and everything else so you know, while you're doing and that's not a criticism of him it's just saying like uh, Dr. Calderon was uh, uh, alluding to if you have a bigger bench that there's just more resources to avail yourself of and and so I think it would be a real boon to to the early career person because mm -hmm. the reality is that as we all know I mean you're not you know you shouldn't be left alone in a room <laughs> doing an arterial switch operation for three years probably or, or longer or longer yeah. and and uh, I don't know that that reality is really well advertised or understood publicly, but mm. certainly anybody like yourself who's recently graduated or Dr. Maschio, you know, testified to this morning, you, it's a whole new world, right? Like mm -hmm. all of a sudden. And so that early career training uh, piece is, is critical. And I think this sort of... Uh, trend or structure or whatever uh, would help. Yeah, Chris, you were at a major guy. training center for a long time. Texas Children's, mm -hmm. one of the biggest centers yep. in the country. But even a center that big um, brings up an issue of this kind of symmetric regionalization or referral thing, which is also a real thing. You mentioned Joe Durani. Even though I was at a large institution you know, when a family talked to me about where can I get the best Epstein's repair, yeah. sent him to Joe. Yeah. Right. Uh, really tough Mapka kid, Frank Hanley. Right. Um, I think arguably a, a very tough uh, pulmonary vein stenosis. We were the place Houston. to go. Uh, or, or Boston. Or Toronto. Um, yeah, yeah, or yeah. Toronto. But the point is that... Yeah. Even among the large centers, we need to recognize there are some places that are highly specialized, and they don't necessarily have to be big places. You can have a small place that is really dug into a very, very specific uh, type of operation mm -hmm. where there may be a great deal of expertise. And, uh, you know, we tend to think about regionalization along a gradient of volume but there's also this other thing that happens even among the high volume centers there are there's a gradient of expertise that we have to recognize as well and you know if we're going to really maximize benefit for our patients that has to be on the table too as something that gets considered uh, by yeah. you know every center mm -hmm. well we're running getting close to being out of time so I'm going to throw one last question out to the group and as you've thought about this over over your careers what is the alternative if the goal is to provide more consistent outcomes across programs do you see any alternatives to sort of this strategy I'll take that all right I, I well, but you go ahead well you know we when we did the recommendations paper which was um, you know, multidisciplinary. It's uh, been endorsed by 14 different organizations. I mean, I think we uh, talked a lot about what the next step could be. I mean, these are recommendations, and as Chris pointed out, I think there's 300 separate recommendations, 39 pages, um, and people have come to me and said, we're looking at these, and we've actually taken these to our administrators, and we're taking these recommendations to try to implement what, you know, all of these societies think is necessary. But the other next possible step would be for the Congenital Heart Surgery Society to start certifying centers based on their uh, meeting the criteria that we've already set up, you know, that we have said these are these are the things that you should do. And, I, you know, David, you and I have talked about this. So. Yeah, and, it, and I don't, it doesn't necessarily mean uh, it, it does hey, you're not meeting criteria 276 or something so much as some sort of process has yet to be defined. Uh, just like the American College of Surgeons does for, for trauma centers and for pediatric surgery, I think to have a similar process within the field of congenital heart surgery would be um, 
you know, it's not a substitute necessarily, but it would be a complementary or third rail thing where, you know, maybe based upon our work on, you know, small volume uh, outcomes and quality based and in a variety of sources of information um, to uh, then uh, come up with some sort of certification uh, policy procedure process then <clears throat> you know uh, it's a way to reassure the public that we're taking care of business mm. which was really you know um, Carl referred to the the stories we're all uh, painfully familiar with uh, about bad outcomes in certain localities and we you know looked at each other and said we need to do something about this we can't just sit here letting this go on and we have to assume as a society you have to assume responsibility for this so that's what we're trying to do we're not out to get anybody we're just we're, it's it's owning it's owning the thing and uh, I think a, some sort of certification process is a, a very logical follow-on to articulating what places ought to look like large or small well, I'd like to thank all of our panelists today for their time and expertise. Um, we at Seminars uh, look forward to ongoing research and discussion on this topic so that we can continue to provide our patients with the best possible patient care experiences and outcomes. Thanks. Thanks for having thank you, Tracy. us. Thank you, Tracy. All right.